We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way for questions to come through is through the website. We're not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Today's topic comes from Nate Parker, who tweeted to ask, I was hoping you could twist your arm, I could twist your arm into doing a write-up or podcast episode covering how to run a good RPG session for a gaming event, con, public event, etc. I feel like it is different from regular sessions you have, you have with known players, and I would love to hear some experienced people talk about it. Well, thanks for the topic, Nate. Um, we got you both ways. So if you head over to the blog, you can already read an article, and we're going to discuss that here tonight. So we got you on the blog and on the podcast. I got to say, I'm glad to see some role-playing questions showing up now and then. I've said it many times on the show. I say it way more often on social media. To me, tabletop means any game where I sit down with friends and play together. And that very much includes RPGs, even those played over a virtual tabletop and through modern technology like Skype. Though that's not what today's topic about, we're definitely talking about playing in person. Yeah. Now, I'm pretty rusty on RPG in general, and I've never really sought out the role of GM. But I have to say, one-off con games are what I have the most recent experiences with as a player. Now, personally, I've got a lot of experience both ways, uh, both running and playing public play role playing games. Uh, this includes weekly game nights at the local game store, the friendly local game store. Uh, I used to organize events for Dungeons and Dragons. I was a Herald level DM for RPGA through Dungeons and Dragons back when you used to have to like, take a test to run public events. Um, I've also run, played many games. Uh, I've also campaign games, both at home and at local game stores. Now, over the years, I've learned that there is a significant, I would say, major difference between running a long-term campaign and running a one-shot. They are two totally different things. Uh, and by one-shot, I mean a single session or even sort session where you're just playing one or two. Uh, the focus, the tone, and the pacing are all completely different. Now, player expectations are also different. And that includes the DM as a player. I don't just mean the players versus the DM. I mean everyone at the table. I would go so far as to say that they're really completely different beasts. Like you're almost running a different game. Now, some game moderators prefer one style over the other. I know some that only run one style of game and others who do both one shots and campaigns. The GM needs to have a level of comfort with whichever format that you're choosing to run. Players new or experienced can feel the discomfort of a GM who's out of their element and that can impact the game. That is very true. We're going to pause for one second because I'm hearing my audio is going in and out. Yeah, your uh, your Skype connection is doing... Garbage. Is... Huh. Your, I don't your, know what else I Your internet do. connection of late. Uh... I heard static, like white noise, and I've never heard that any time we've recorded. Two apps are using my microphone. You know what? Give me a sec. Well, yeah, two apps are app. using your microphone. Skype oh, and uh, Audacity. Yeah, yeah, all, all the tablets are on. It's weird, because like we paid to upgrade our internet significantly. Well, just think what we this would be like if you hadn't. Um. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's true. All right. I don't know if you're going to want to wave at the camera once I'll, we uh, try I'll, I'll this. do an. I'll actually just do another transition. Um. Like we're in a good spot to break anyway, because I'm about to start talking about public play as mm -hmm. opposed. Might be your physical mic or headset. No, I think that's Skype. Skype does that. It starts breaking up. We shouldn't have any static. Well, he's right. This. Static static is strange. Like static, I don't know. Has anyone heard is. static or just I, I thought I did, yeah. Weird. Sounds horrible, but <laughs> mm -hmm. I said that sounds horrible, but not uh, not wow. horrible because of Skype. Three, three campaign games going at a time. I don't know. Getting frustrated by technology that should be working fine. 
start rebooting the modem before going on, but that's it. This could it still could be the router. I've been having router problems like the fact I should probably buy a new one. They cost money though. They do. I don't have anything open. I don't think it's anything running on my PC. Well, you're sounding solid right now anyway, so Yeah, but that <laughs> doesn't No, the only thing using the network right now is Skype and just a little bit Chrome, but I got the chat room open. Right. That is it. So holy crap, is there a lot of stuff running in Chrome for <laughs> not having much open? I could start doing that is disable all my extensions. I don't know if it would help. Oh man, I wish I got that much role playing in. That's one of the reasons we don't talk about role playing much. I've been begging people to come over on Monday nights and play a game, and I haven't. I like what five weeks in a row. I'm like, I'm gonna run this. Come, and no one shown up. Right. It's been. <clears throat> yeah, maybe I should start playing online. All right, I guess I'll close all this, and we'll get back to it. I don't know where you're starting off here. Where are the notes? Am I starting here, or are you jumping somewhere? Uh, let me just uh, do a quick, quick little uh, jump cut here. The GM needs to have a level of comfort with whichever format they choose to run. Players, new or experienced, can feel the discomfort in a GM out of their element, and that can imp impact the game. Now, public play. That is uh, Pandora's box, right? That's a whole new set of difficulties but also opportunities uh playing at home can be very different from playing at a public venue and playing with strangers while i personally love public play and have run a ton of games in public over the years there are some things that you have to consider when running this way now today we're going to discuss some tips that i've learned over the many years i've been running games to make the most out of running a one shot or an event game in public whether that's at your local game store or at a con at a comic con or just anywhere you may be playing with strangers. Now, the best advice I'd ever heard, this is my number one thing when running any type of one-shot game, and this applies to both playing in public or if you're just playing with your home group, is get to the action right away. Um, there's a term I use, but it's that I'm stealing from the misdirected Mark guys, but it would require Sean dinging it out. I would just say get to the monkey. There's another word in there. Don't waste time. Don't waste time on the background or the setup or explaining your awesome game world. Just dive right into the action. You should never waste time with things like shopping, chatting with NPCs that don't matter, travel time, or basically anything else that is not actual action that pushes the story forward. Now, while in your home game, the number of torches and rations you have, the weight distribution of your gear on horses may matter intensely but you are mm -hmm. time constrained in a public play setting. Micromanaging details is not what this is about. Exactly. Uh, the only time you do want to do that, if you're tracking rations, this better be a game where you're going to starve if you run out. You better be playing Dark Sun when you're on your last wineskin of water. And if you're counting torches, it might best be because a dragon's going to show up when the last one runs out. You're not just tracking equipment. Heck, most public play games I play, you don't even have an equipment list. It's more about what your characters have on them. Now, I'm not just talking about starting the game in media res. I'm sure everyone who's ever run a game, read any article on gaming advice, is going to hear about the first section start in media res. Yes, that is one way to talk about getting to the action right away. But I'm not just talking about that first scene. Yes, start in media res. It's awesome. But this applies to every scene, every action taken. If the action that's about to happen isn't inciting and doesn't add to the story, skip it. If what matters is what behind the what's behind the door, start the action with the door opening, not listening at the door and checking for traps. The door opens and you find. If you're running a dungeon, the adventure should start at the opening of the dungeon, at a minimum. If there's actually nothing at the ocean, the opening of the dungeon until room three, start the action in room three. Start the game right then. Later on, if there's a series of empty rooms. Do a montage describing the group going through room after room, finding nothing but old bits of rusted metal, dust, and rotted over everything that's not important to the current story. Everything that happens should matter and have an impact on the story and the game. 
Now that's not just to suggest that action is the only way to have an impact, of course. There are mm -hmm. many ways to affect a character's life and advance a story, and choice of genres certainly impacts that as well. Yeah, now, I, I totally agree. I, don't, I can't think of a thing to even add to that. But yeah, I'm, I'm talking about making it action, but it's, it's not just action, advancing the story. Something has to change in the game world. Something has to be impacted. Now, the second best I've ever, advice I've ever received about running a one-shop RPG section the session that's actually, to be honest, possibly just as important as getting to the monkey, but it applies equally to public play and playing at home, is remember, uh, this is something I've only ever heard in the last year from a variety of podcasts. Again, credit to Mr. Rec and Mark Crew and the GEM team for, for getting this one stuck in my head, is that remember that this game is about the biggest day in the character's life. Because the thing is, with a single session role-playing game, this is they're one and done. You show up, you play, you go home. You only get one chance to wow the players. No one is going to go home excited and talking about the game they had where they explored the dungeon and went through three rooms and found 50 gold. The game has to be as exciting and engaging as possible, and that starts with the story and plot. A one-shot needs to be the window into the most important day of your character's lives. Now, and I think it's important, Mo, uh, what Mo said there is characters plural. You mm -hmm. need to have the right number of players at the table for your story. Shoehorn in extra ones because they're a friend, and you could be allowing one of the players who paid to be there, perhaps, to not feel as important as they should during an event. Yeah, you always have to share the spotlight. Now, you could always run a one-shot where the players go into the dungeon and steal the, the shiny MacGuffin. Great. How, like, how many one-shots? I've played many con games. They're just that. And you know what? They work. Like, they're a game. They're enjoyable. But how much cooler would it be that you snuck into the dungeon and killed a damn dragon? What if you killed Tiamat? Why tell the story about disrupting the orc supply lines when you can tell the story of how a small band of heroes defeats the orc warlord? You don't want to run the Star Wars game where you negotiate with the smugglers to get some new X-Wings. You want to blow up the damn Death Star. You are running a teenage angst-based game, you know, a Monster Hearts or um, Young Justice-style game. It better be Homecoming or Prom Night during that game. If you're running a Shadow Run, you better not be just stealing something from as technology. How about instead assassinate the CEO? Like right now, it's time for the Battle of Far of Armies, not meeting the Ents for the first time. Yeah, think about superheroes. Uh, they hopefully spend most of their days patrolling and hoping nothing will happen. Uh, no one wants to spend money and take the time out of a, of a con only to play a superhero getting the ketchup stains off their cape at the dry cleaner after stopping a, a runaway hot dog cart. <laughs> Cute. Very true. Now, another thing with one shots is the one shots one and done. There's no long term effect. You're not going to ruin your campaign or mess with the world. This is your chance to break the rules. This is where you can toss cannon out of the out out of the game completely. This is where you can literally destroy a setting. You like not only threaten the norm, but like destroy it, like blow up the forgotten realms. It's time for an apocalypse. Have Ragnarok happen. Have the fall of civilization happen. This is time for that once in a lifetime heist, the score to end all scores, the last job before you retire. It's your last day on the force. It's the day you were recruited by the MIB. It's that event that brings you back out of retirement. Remember, it's the most important day in your character's lives. Not only story rules, but game rules as well. Now, don't throw them out the window, but don't let yourself or your players get bogged down on minute details either. Dice rules don't matter as much as story and engagement for that short block of time you have your players. Yeah, it's got to be the big bang. That's, it's, it's the wow factor. No one's going to be talking about the game where you rolled a bunch of threes and you got stuck in the hallway and the orcs heard us and then we got ambushed and like get things moving, get the plot going, have important things happen and have the results be something dramatic. Now, my next tip is about getting players invested. Now, you can do this best by tying the characters both to the plot and to each other before the first scene. Every player at the table should know who their character is, why their character is invested in what's about to happen, and why they are with and care about the other characters at the table. 
Now, a one-shot is not the kind of place to determine your party dynamic. You shouldn't be starting off meeting at an inn and trying to figure out why you know each other. That should all be pre-established before the game even starts. Now, nudging players towards or away certain character types may also come into play here if you have knowledge of them, the players. Uh, while the known introvert, quiet player might truly want to experiment, break out of their doldrums, and be the bold, chatty hero. And that's to be encouraged. That's part of what's great about one-off con play. If they don't want that, make sure that they get a role suit, more suited to how they actually want to play. Don't force unwilling players into roles they may not be comfortable with because it will affect everyone at the table. So you know it's the most important day in the characters' lives. Make sure that's clear to the players. Now, this can be done with background written on the character sheets. Keep it brief. No making people read for 20 minutes at the start of your game. Uh, it could be a pregame discussion, or it could just be the first scene of the game brings out what's happening. The characters should make sense and be tied to the story that's about to evolve. I can't tell how many times down to a with a bunch of pre that the use like a random character generator to make and they have absolutely nothing to do with the plot. Don't do that. Don't put a ranger in the group that's about to spend the entire night in a city. Don't throw in a decker if the heist doesn't require hacking. Skip the bounty hunter unless their target's going to show up during that game. Yeah, your character sheets and intro are where you have a short time to get players hooked and make them buy into your world. Now, one next level trick, this is something I'm seeing more and more of that seems to have been growing with uh, the advent of modern storytelling games, is to source the table. Uh, make characters that would all theoretically be involved in the plot that's about to happen, but then ask the players why they think their characters would actually get involved. So why did you want to steal the original Kyber crystal? What has Tiamat taken from you that you feel she needs to be killed? Why do you need to be rewarded with money so badly? Things like that get the players not only invested in the characters, but also ties them into the story and plot. You want to establish inter-party relationships at the start of the game, too. Now, this can be done with questions like, whose lives did you save during the last adventure? Having the player pick another player or another character at the table. Or what item did Sean find that you're jealous of? Or who does the boss pay attention to you over you, and do you care? While this was something that existed loosely back in the day, with a lot of modern storytelling games, this is a much more vital aspect. Relationships can drive the story and the action even, which is both a boon and can be a bane of the modern DM if they aren't yes. prepared for that interaction and development. Not only the modern DM, but the modern player. Some players are not comfortable with this. So that is another secret. When you do source the table, make sure you have answers yourself. So if the person doesn't know, you can kind of lead them on, right? Like if you say, who's live, do you say during the last time? And they're like, oh, I don't know. And they, well, what do you think if it's Sean? And this is why. Be ready to fill that in because especially some more traditional players aren't going to be used to this type of um, shared adventure building or shared world building. Now, just yesterday, I tuned into the Mark podcast. I don't even think it's really a direct inspiration, but they did a fantastic show on these kinds of specific questions, what they call leading questions. Uh, this is going to be episode 370, if you want to check that out. I think by the time our show drops on Tuesday, that should be live. Now, during the last bit, I talked about doing things before the game starts. Now, people often call this, when they're talking about campaign games or home games, Session Zero. And people think of Session Zero as a standalone night. Like, let's all get together and do Session Zero, then next week we'll start the game. But Session Zero doesn't have to be a standalone game session. It's something you should be doing before any game, even a one-shot. These pre-game conversations are especially vital with public play events, and I hope this will make it clear why. Because these are some things you should do before any role-playing game starts, whether this is a campaign or a single session. You want to start off as the, the game moderator and explain what the game is about and make sure everyone at the table has bought into that. Now, I'm not saying give away your plot and say, here's going to be our whole adventure. I'm just talking about a high-level overview that says, hey, we're here, we're playing Shadowrun, we're going to be doing a heist, we're going against as technology, and there's going to be some betrayal in the third scene. Is everyone cool with that? Something like that, right? Now, for a con game, there should have been some kind of con event write-up, right? Like, you're going to have some kind of 
book that says, hey, show up and play Shadowrun. You're going to see this. For a public play event, there's usually something posted somewhere, right? A Facebook group saying the different games. But sometimes it's really hard to get information across. And someone might show up to your game with a completely different expectation and show up and go, oh, wait, we're doing a heist. Well, I actually thought we were going to be shooting a bunch of gangers. Um, maybe this game's not right for you. Yeah. It might even be safest to assume that the people will not grasp your concept before they sit down. Yeah. While Cheap Ducks in the MCU, <laughs> a superhero game about fast-talking cigars and extremity webbing might make sense to you. Others wow. might not be as familiar with Howard the Duck and be expecting to play Iron Man instead of anthropomorphic ducks. Wow, really? You, you, Sean, if you run a con game, I think that's, <laughs> that's going to have to be it. I, well, I, I know I was inspired by Dawn. Do you remember the cheap ducks? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> Why do they want that? cheap ducks? Yeah, uh, this is, uh, the cheap ducks reference I got. Yep. Uh, I, the, the extremity webbing got me a little thrown off there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. Uh, so one method of doing this pre-game conversation, this is something pretty modern, something pretty cool, and it's called CATS, C-A-T-S. Uh, this was created by uh, Patrick O'Leary, uh, there'll be a link to him in the show notes and his blog post. And he just suggests you discuss four things before any game session. And you want to get players to buy in on this. Now, the first one you're going to talk about is concept. That's basically what I already mentioned. You're going to pitch your game. What's it about? Your three-minute pitch, hopefully shorter, actually, at the con game. You want to do this as quick as possible. What's the pitch? Like, are you, are you blowing up the Death Star? Are you going on a raid? Are you trying to steal the largest block of ice you've ever seen in your entire life in a game all about water shortages? You're going to try to pitch that. What's it about? Next, you're going to talk about the aim. What are the players trying to accomplish? Now, this, for most RPGs, is pretty clear, but is there a win condition? Sometimes there are. Sometimes there's a win, sometimes there's a loss. But the other thing I mention here is if you're trying to tell a specific type of story, like, hey, this is going to be a heist game. Oh, hey, we're trying to do a buddy cop story. Or, hey, we're trying to do uh, a run and gun. We're just, or we're just going to go and slaughter as many orcs as we can which kind of sets us to our next one, which is tone. Have a quick conversation about this. Is this a serious game? Is it a comedy? Are you going to go gonzo? If it's a serious game, everyone should know that before the game starts. If you're trying to run a horror game, even in Paranoia, you want to let everyone know that, hey, we're playing Paranoia, but we're going to treat it as something creepy. And it's going to be horrific what the computer does to us. Like, we're thinking 1984 meets Paranoia here, not a gonzo game. And everyone... And again, you want to get consent here. You want everyone to buy in. Next is subject matter. Here's where you're going to explain what ideas may be explored during the gameplay. Uh, I mentioned this when I did the little quick little Shadowrun blurb there that, hey, in the third act, there's going to be some betrayal. Is there a chance that something's going to come up during the game that may make someone uncomfortable, that may impact their fun? The point of this is to sit down at a table and play a game and have fun together you want to talk about any subject matter that could impact someone else's fun. You want to set any boundaries if needed. And here with boundaries, we could probably talk for another entire episode or two and both gain and lose some listeners in the process. <laughs> yeah, this is, you know what, the, this is a, a controversial topic and it shouldn't be, to be honest, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the topic of subject matter and boundaries does lead me to safety tools. Tabletop gaming safety tools should always been used when playing with strangers. Personally, I also think you should be using them when you play with your friends and in your home game, but especially when playing with strangers. But again, as Sean mentioned, we're not going to dig into safety tools here. That's a completely different topic that many other people who are much better wordsmiths than me have covered. Um, tools I'm talking about, though, include the X card, lines and veils, uh, script change, the open door policy, and so on. Now, this was something I had no concept of as a player until I rejoined the world of modern cons recently. Uh, I admit, I am wildly privileged. Uh, and those I played with generally were as well. But once I got over my old man, get off the lawn, gut reactions to the idea, they really do make a lot of sense. And I think some of our play back in the day would have benefited yeah. from some of these ideas, even if we couldn't have imagined that at the time. No, oh, I totally agree. There, there is stuff that should have been X-carded in some of our games, even more recent games that I've run. I just hadn't thought of it before. Because I got to say, even if you don't think your game is going to have potentially harmful content, if in your head you think potentially harmful content is rape and torture, 
uh, you never know what might actually bother another player. Everyone at the table is there to have fun. And all of these tools aren't there to censor you or to ruin your game. They're there to facilitate fun. They are there to make your game open and welcoming to all. Now, that got a little too serious in my mind. Like, yes, we should be talking about this, but it's not all grimdark, right? Like, the point of this pregame talk is to make sure of one thing. Everyone at the table is on the same page, sitting down to play the same game. Everyone knows what to expect, and any required boundaries are clearly communicated and understood. Though it does sound like a lot of work when we talk about it all in a row like this, and we itemize it, or if you look at it all written out, the entire process should only take you a 10 minutes or so, maybe 15. And I gotta say, 10 minutes spent at the beginning of the session to make sure everyone is on board can save you a ton of heartaches later. You're going to be playing for probably two to four hours. Spending a few minutes is the least you can do to make sure the rest of the experience is the best it can be for all those who choose to be involved in it. Now, my final tip for tonight uh, is that for pub public play one shots, you should have characters that are, if not completely ready to play, nearly ready to play. And I personally prefer nearly ready to play. Now, we all know most people who play role-playing games love character generation. They love rolling up their characters or spending their points or whatever that is. And almost everyone I've met who plays RPGs has an aversion to pre-generated characters. But it's just not realistic to make fully-fledged characters for an entire group of people during a one-shot. And it's not just a time issue either, right? Like, look at my suggestions above. Most of them that we already talked about, uh, most of them aren't going to work if you don't have a pre-established group of characters with pre-established ties to the plot and pre-established relationships. Yeah. Now, I'll admit that this is less true for many modern storytelling games than it is for more classical game systems. But even in those modern systems, at least the general role is usually assigned, even if other aspects are left for the player or players to develop as a group. Right. No, uh, it's true. There are some exceptions. I'll mention them in a little bit, especially Powered by the Apocalypse games. There are some games where you're going to make characters. But the thing is, you're trying to make it the most important day of a character's life, right? How do you do that if you don't know who the characters are before the game starts? Like, there's some really fine improv DMs out there. I don't even know if any of them could take sick characters making completely random characters that you have no idea what you're going to get when you first start it. It's going to be really dis difficult, too, doing the cats thing and discussing the aim of your game if you don't know who the participants are. It's going to be way easier to tie the characters to the plot if you're creating those characters at the same time you're creating the plot before the game starts. Yeah. Now, the less experienced GM will want to generally lean towards more complete characters for players. And then, as you grow more comfortable with your improvisational skills, you can dial it back some and allow players more freedom at the start, keeping in mind time requirements. Now, getting back to those mo more modern systems, there are some out there that highly encourage creating characters at the table for one-shots. And I gotta say, I'm not a huge fan of this in part. I don't mind creating parts of a character at the table. Actually, I, I like that. I encourage that. Please leave some blanks on my character sheet for me to fill out or give me a few options to pick from to make the character my own. Like seriously, at a minimum nowadays, let me choose my name, gender, and pronouns at least, if nothing else. Just don't sit your players down to a blank piece of paper and have them fill it out top to bottom. Yeah, as I mentioned before, roles here are important. The group dynamic should be pre-established so that you don't end up trying to defeat an alien menace with five healers or face mm -hmm. off against a plot of foreign intrigue with nothing but a group of tanks. Yeah. Uh, again, you want the characters to tie to the plot. How, how are the foreign intrigue characters going to have the day of their lives fighting tanks? It just doesn't work. Like, even if you're running Powered by the Apocalypse, in my opinion, limit the playbooks so that they're the ones that fit the story you're going to be telling. Have some of the information picked out right? Like Powered by the Apocalypse, most of the games have you circled stuff. Have some of it circled, just not everything. Um, start selecting moves, right? Like if you've got a bunch of starting moves to pick from, give the players two or three options, but pick the rest of them. If you're running a fate game, determine most, if not all of the characters' aspects. Like I'd probably leave the high, com high concept open, or if you have a really thematic game, that's the one I would fill out and leave the rest open. Uh, just make sure that the ones you put in tied to the game at hand. And also, just a little extra tip, make sure you have extra characters. 
Uh, one reason I do this is just in case I end up with extra players. Now, this is not something I expected when I first started running games in public play, but I would be running Dungeons and Dragons at Hugen and Munin, long gone game store. Um, and people would come in and be like, oh, what are you playing? I used to have extra character sheets on hand and I'd hand them a character sheet. Well, why don't you sit down and learn? And I would have people join in during the game. And that, I swear, I have gotten more people into the hobby of role-playing by doing that than anything else I've done as an ambassador for gaming. Literally having people, as they're watching me play, say, sit down at the table, here's a character sheet, don't worry, we'll teach you what to do. So that's one of the reasons I have extra characters. Plus, I also want the characters to not feel forced into taking a, a specific character. So if I have six players and six options, someone's probably going to get stuck with someone they don't want. Uh, so I'd like to have like six, like eight. I have a couple extra characters to pick from. Yeah. So this is a comfort level thing and better for more experienced GMs like Mo. As I mentioned before, you don't want to dilute the experience for some overloading the game with characters uh, as a new uh, GM, and you may not be prepared to have extra characters come in. And again, keep them, keep it all as the important, most important day in all their lives. Yes. Uh -oh. Fair enough. Yeah, the extra characters, usually what I do, like this was Dungeons and Dragons, right? I'd have a couple extra fighters, right? You can always have a couple. I didn't have an extra magic user just sitting on the side. I'd, I'd have a couple, you know, tanks, fighters, or an archer, or a ranger, or something like that, right? They were, they were, they were the, the, the extras, because these new people who are, if, especially if it is a new player, you probably don't want to throw them into the most exciting day of their character's life for their first RPG experience in, in that way, like if it's going around. So I got to say, this is just some of my tips. These are my top that I could think of because, man, there is a lot more involved. But for the sake of time, because we try to keep this podcast down to an hour and a half, and when I wrote this up on a blog post, I didn't want people to be reading for hours and write a small book. I uh, just realized that we have not get, gotten into everything or even any, even close to everything for running a con game or a one shot. Because like we didn't even talk about pacing game length, making sure your game will fit in the time. We didn't talk about beat structure or dealing with things, just being in public, like not enough lighting or being in a loud room. Now, I got to say, if those are topics you are interested in hearing Sean and I talk about, let us know. Maybe we'll return to this in a later episode. All right, so back in the lobby now, uh... We're going to look at your thoughts on running a public RPG event. And the lobby has had quite a lot to say in here. I'd like to thank uh, Brian for joining us again for a awesome. change. Hardly ever see you around. It's always fantastic uh, when you do. Uh, yeah, again, people are saying things uh, like Brian mentions. Your pre-gen pre character has to be mechanically nearly ready to yes. play. But then left more of the narrative characteristics of the characters to the first phase of play. Um, Major Kayla has a... Oh, no, sorry. Go ahead. One of the one of the ones I really like I've seen a lot of in the modern games is the the relationship web set up between the other characters. We kind of alluded to that. I really like the hey, your character is mechanically done, and you're going to name your character. You're going to determine how they look, and you're going to have a little bit of background. You're going to each say that out loud, right? Like what your thing is, and then you're going to pick someone you hate. You're going to pick someone you like, whatever that mechanic is, right? So from Hydro Hackers, you pick someone you're tight with. You have a bunch of people you're cool with, and then there's someone you're putting up with. And just doing that little tie-in really ties things together. Now, uh, Major Kayla had a fantastic little story here. They played a game where no one had a magical weapon, and the villain could only be damaged with a magical weapon. Yeah, see, it, <laughs> how, how, how is that exciting? Like, how is that the, is that the well, memorable story? Now to, be fair, now, to be fair, it is a memorable story, because one of the players had a spell book they found and became beating the villain about the head with <laughs> okay. the magic spell book. So, you know what, it, de again, depending on the players and the GM, things like that can evolve, yeah. but it's really better if you can try and plan things just a little bit better and give, give them a little more chance so they don't have to uh, dig in oh, too Fair deeply. enough, like, I, I played enough con games that were the, the free room dungeon the the three fights with two RP role playing scenes in between, like I've done them all, and and they're enjoyable enough. Like I I okay I've had a couple bad experiences, but those aren't the ones where I come back to Windsor and I'm telling people like oh my god you should have played, you know Hydro Hackers we stole an airship and we did this thing like I alluded to the Hydro Hackers game right so Phil Vecchione was uh, from the Misdirected Mark group had 
a game where you're it's a heist game so in this game water shortages are is a big thing you can listen to phil on an interview on the tabletop bellhop gaming podcast I'm sure sean or someone can probably pull out the episode number talking about his game but in it water is super scarce right it's all controlled by the big corporation and stealing water is a big deal and pure water only comes from the mines of europa so it gets like literally float in from space and in this game at first he was going to have you like steal a liter of water right and then he's like wait this is a one shot this should be the the heist the big heist the biggest heist these people have ever seen this should be the so then it became a like block of ice that you stole which is just like like billions of dollars worth of water right and it, it just the the it, and it, when we started the adventure right like we're playing it we're like well a block like a how big like six feet by four feet. I'm like, seriously, that much water? It is such an important part of it, right? And the other lesson he learned is that if you're a DM and you put an airship in your game, someone will want to hijack the airship. Uh, and uh, who do we have here? Uh, Boo RPG is mentioning he got put into a Starfinder game as a pilot. And the only book of the adventure that he got to play on was on a jungle oh. planet the entire yeah. time. They said the bounty hunter, right? Uh, like you, you put out the the bounty hunter in Star Wars. If you have a bounty hunter and you're playing a Star Wars game and it's a one shot, the bounty better show up, right? Or if you're the smuggler and you have a debt, the debt better get called in, right? Like that's sh that that kind of background stuff shouldn't be background stuff during a one shot. And uh, Phil was on our uh, H2O with Phil Vecchione special episode. It wasn't actually in one of our numbered episodes. Oh, it wasn't a numbered episode. No, so was, uh, you can still find that in our backlog. There's a absolutely. link on the website. If you uh, it, was between, it was between episode and 13 and 14. So episode 13.5, I guess, or uh, uh, in, the, in the stream of uh, things. So to quote Boudé RPG, old advice from English professors, the story you're telling isn't the most interesting time in your character's lives. You should be telling that story. Which is exactly our point. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, and she games is now pointing out it's an airship. How can you not right, right want now to we get, a, we get a whole bunch of people agreeing with us, basically. Are there any new tips we missed? Uh, I know Major Kayla is mentioning that uh, when she gets a new pregen, she always looks at the personalities and quirks, quirks before mm -hmm. even bothering looking at the stacks, the stats. Yeah. I gotta admit, like I played D and D at a con game, but I still wouldn't say I played D and D Fifth Edition because I played a con game and it was a great game. I had a great time, but I don't know if I mechanically played D and D at all. Yep. Uh, and Boudet RPG is uh, just sort of pointing out the benefits of some of the safety tools we mentioned. Uh, he had, uh, or they had, two arachnophobes line out spiders, which he They're had broken. planned on dumping spiders yeah. on the adventurers during the the. Uh, during the event. And, you know, that's just one of those little things that, you yeah, know, you sure, spider. spiders, but, you know, most people aren't, a lot of people may not be that sort of level of arachnophobe. And these people spoke up and, and gave them a chance. Yeah. And one of the examples I had heard is player shows up to a game. No one knows this happened. They start playing and the character's father gets threatened and the player breaks down. Well, it ended up two days before the person's father died. You don't show up to the table and say, hey, my dad died. Don't talk about dads, right? Like, it's yeah. one of those things. If, though, if you do a session zero and you sit down ahead of time, but that's an example of something that got X-carded because the player wasn't thinking someone's going to threaten my character's dad. Like, that was the, they were there to forget about what had just happened in their life, and then all of a sudden something came up, and that's where a tool like the X-card is extremely valuable, and it's not censoring, right? It's, it's true. Uh, like I said, people, people more eloquent than I have said better things about it. I am not the, the best wordsmith at times, but I think they are valuable to use. And like I said, especially in public play, when you don't know who you're playing with, you don't know what might upset them. And again, it's it's, an, it's a difficult for us as well because we went through so much of our role-playing mm -hmm. life and development without those concepts. Yeah. Um, and so the people who have grown up with those ideas and those needs and those wants on the table... Uh, who weren't, you know, big white guys who, yeah. you know, didn't have necessarily have as many concerns or didn't care about the concerns because we were being our, you know, rep repressed white maleness, uh, you know, and, and so there, there's a very different feeling for certain people and certain uh, groups of people and people who have grown up with those tools. Yeah. And those are people I want to game with. And that's Absolutely. the point. 
is now we want to open the table to everyone. All right. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, Boudet RPG mentions, it's valuable for as many people as possible to extol the virtues of safety mechanics because so many people in the hobby hand wave them out of privilege. And that's very, very true. Uh, you know, I, I kind of dismissed them early on and I've, I have grown past that to really see the benefit uh, for a lot of people. Even if it's not something I may necessarily feel the need to use, I feel the need to put them out there for those people who do need them. Mm -hmm. That and you never know when you're going to need them. Like, Absolutely. You really don't. And the other thing, too, is the X card's not always about correcting tone. Sometimes you are playing a horror game and someone makes a bad McDonald's joke in the middle of your horror game, right when someone's about to be stabbed. And it's like, dude, like that total, like you just killed the whole scene, right? Like yeah. it's not just about safety, it's also about tone policing, right? Or yep. tone policing is probably the wrong word. Tone. Watching tone again. Yeah. My words. <laughs> All right. Well, I need to write it. this stuff ahead of time, and then I can talk about it a little better. All right. Well, that's it for this week's Ask the Bellhop. If you'd like to read more gaming and game night topics like this, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice. If you got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. If you want more RPG topics, that's how to get us to keep talking role-playing games as well as board games. Said it's all about the tabletop.